welcome everyone to connecting with communities outside the university. Um, one of the first panels of the Humanities Podcasting Symposium of 2022. Um, super grateful to have you here. My name is Kim Adams. I'm one of the founding members of the Humanities Podcast Network. Um, I co-host a podcast called High Theory, and I am excited to be here with my two co-panelists. You guys want to say hi? Hello, I'm Blair Hodges. I am in Salt Lake City, Utah. I host a show called Fireside with Blair Hodges, where I interview scholars and activists and artists about their work and how it connects with the world. And hello, I'm Paul Dedecker. I'm in um, St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador on the very eastern tip, the furthest east you can get in North America. And um, I am a linguistics professor at Memorial University and also host a podcast called Some Stutter La, which is a, a bit of Newfoundland English vernacular uh, in the title there. Our uh, logo and uh, a name is behind me there. And uh, it's, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get along, but it's a, it's a, it's a podcast um, that features people with communication challenges. Cool. Um, so Blair, do you want to start us off? Because I know you have some cool slides for us to look at. Sure. Let's see if I can share my screen. Yes. Good. Okay. Ooh, fancy. Connecting with communities outside the academy. That's what we're talking about. And um, the three panelists are going to touch on some different aspects of this, and there might be some crossover, but we also would like to have questions and some conversation from you all at the end. So each of us will take about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have some time at the end to ask questions. Okay. It's been a while since I presented on Zoom, even though I did it a ton during COVID. Uh, let's start by talking about making content that connects. If, uh, if you're in this session, you already have an interest in connecting outside the academy. And um, so I'm going to talk about how content can do that. And I want to start with an example from the show that I produce, Fireside, where I interview scholars. And so Ayala Fader, uh, you see her here, is an anthropologist, and she wrote a book about ultra-Orthodox Jews. Um, and especially or ultra Orthodox Jews who come to doubt their faith and encounter problems in their religious community, which is also their entire life. And so um, in talking to her about her research, one of the things I like to do with uh, all of the guests that I have to the extent that they're willing is talk to them about how the work itself impacts them as a scholar. Um, and so I wanted to play a clip from this. It's two or three minutes. And then I'm going to unpack some of the things that uh, that Isla Fader mentions in this. So uh, I'll turn it on here and hopefully this works. Did this book change you at all in the course of researching it? It, it was okay. a big... Hmm. Uh, I just want to make sure. Can, is that audio working? Okay, great. Did this book change you at all in the course of researching it? It, it was a big part of your life for a number of years. Yes. And how did you change as you were also witnessing people changing? Yeah. Being an anthropologist, the research changes you every time that you do it. I always ask myself, like, why am I still working with ultra Orthodox Jews? Like I'm a Jewish New Yorker, right? <laughs> and I'm still working in New York and working with ultra Orthodox Jews. And I know that early on, it was a kind of nostalgia and a way to recuperate a kind of history that was erased for my generation of secular mm. Jews, really. Mm. You know, this was a kind of nostalgia project. I was quickly disabused of that mm. in my early research where I felt like, oh, I thought we were the same. And now I see you don't even recognize me as really being a Jew because my Judaism is so different from yours. Right. And I think some of that fascination, I mean, there's an intellectual interest in in a community that is both very much part of the contemporary world and also a huge critic and a certain kind of religious conservatism that I'm also intellectually interested in. But I think that I do this work in some ways because it is a way that for me, it's a way of practicing Judaism. Like my research is kind of how I do Jewish. Hmm. But 
I do feel like this project in particular, it changed me as an anthropologist in terms of my writing, I would say. Hmm. This project made me want to write for a different audience. It made me want to write both for academics interested in religion and Jewish studies, but also for a wider audience, because I think this was a bigger story than one weird group of Jews. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Like this is a big story about what happens when somebody dramatically changes what they believe in their community and their family and the kinds of ethical choices we all make. So this felt more similar to me in a way than my first project with Hasidic women and girls. It felt like it could be anybody. It could be me. And so my challenge to myself was, can I write a book that speaks to a wider audience, not even only of Jews, but of anybody interested in kind of ethical decision making in our contemporary world? And my challenge to myself is, how and why do I write about this? Like, what are the goals? What is the broader kind of purpose in sharing such a different story for an audience who doesn't have an investment? I mean, I love to write for a Jewish audience. They do have an investment. And I discovered that from my first book. Like, there's an amazing Jewish general public, who, the readership, like, just wide ranging and amazing. I mean, my uncle's bungalow colony had me come and visit their <laughs> book group up in the Adirondacks, which was a delight. But can I reach? beyond the kind of Jewish public and and speak more broadly. Yeah. Yeah. To a thoughtful audience of people who are struggling with like key issues of our times. Okay. So she actually covered a lot there that got at what I'm trying to do with the podcast. And I think what it means to connect with broader uh, communities outside the Academy. So relevance, right? Um, I wanted to explore the personal dimensions of the work, and she talked about how her research had personal dimensions to it. She was interested in Judaism as a Jewish person herself. Not everyone in Jewish studies is. Maybe someone came to Jewish studies for a different reason, but there's a story there, and they can they can talk about that story. It's a human connection with the researcher themselves, with the scholar. What is the scholar's personal investment in the work? And then she said... Um, you know, that this was this was a bigger story than just what was happening with ultra Orthodox Jews. Per, my audience is predominantly, I would say, like 75 percent Mormon background, like Mormon intellectual academy people. Um, and when they see an episode coming across about ultra Orthodox Jews, the first thought they might have is, OK, that I don't I don't really know much about that. I don't know how that connects. But um but I think the the number one piece of feedback I got about this episode is they couldn't believe how much it resonated, not only the similarities, but also the differences. Um, and I loved when Dr. Fader said, as she was doing her research, she said I, that she realized it could be anyone, it could be me. I think that phrase, it could be me, is very important. How people are putting themselves into the stories and ideas that we're sharing on our podcasts. Um, so we need to explore themes that connect with people. Introductions, as I wrote here, introductions really matter uh, to get that theme across. Um, the first 30 seconds, I call it the danger zone. Like people are going to keep listening or not keep listening kind of based on the first 30 seconds of your show. Um, Apple Podcasts has really interesting stats that show that's about how long people will hang in there. Um, the biggest drop off will happen on, in that first 30 seconds. So I like to begin by connecting with a story that connects with a lot of listeners. So with, with this episode, it began by talking about doubt. Um, and especially for people who have uh, been religious or are religious, that's something that most people grapple with. So I'm, I'm going for a bigger idea. Although we're gonna drill down and get specific, I'm beginning with this big, more universal idea. Um, and, and that's what Dr. Fader said, the broader, what's the broader purpose of doing this scholarship? What are the goals? What is she trying to do with this research? Um, that can be a little tricky because depending on your field, some scholars are reluctant to reflect on that level of things. Um, but uh, I think increasingly people are interested in exploring um, perspectivism and bias and uh, in bias in a neutral sense rather than a negative sense. So most of the scholars I've talked with have been really comfortable doing that, uh, even if they haven't spent a ton of time talking publicly about it. Um, the second thing, oh, it's kind of great out there. There's supposed to be a second uh, slide here, but translation. Um, watching jargon, being careful about insider terms, and as a host, being ready to 
to jump in and define something if if someone says, well, post-structuralism comes to bear here, uh, you know, and people might not know what that is. So be prepared to give just a quick, as the host, to be an intermediary between your broader audience guests and or listeners and the guests that you're talking to. Um, a lot of times people will drop names um, uh, and, and it's it's good to just say, oh, yes, the, you know, that particular philosopher, whatever. Uh, so be the intermediary to connect your audience. So relevance and translation are kind of the two things that I try to pay attention to content wise when I'm uh, doing these episodes. How is the content relevant to a broader audience? How is it personal? And then am I doing enough to translate? Is there too many inside uh, terms being used, et cetera. And, and as a host, you get to do that. I talked about the intro being really important. So that's the hook. That's that first thing. What's the, what's the episode or show's focus? What's new or surprising about it? What's your driving question? Um, my, my episodes are an hour long. So there's, there's oftentimes a few driving questions. I'll usually pick the one that I think will grab people the most and trust that in getting to it, they'll uh, appreciate the other things that we talk about, but you want to have, kind of a core idea at the beginning. And then also like, what's the tension or what's at stake? And in this episode with Dr. Fader, it was it was religious doubt or doubt in, uh, you know, this, this extends beyond religion. This can extend to political affiliation. This can extend to being in the academy and maybe you picked a field that <laughs> as you're finishing your PhD, you're wondering if that was the right path. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that people can connect um, with this story and you want to, uh, kind of draw that tension out of the beginning of your episode. And then what are the listeners going to take away from it? I, I ask myself these questions every time, um, especially when I'm putting together the introduction of the episodes. Um, and, and I recommend taking, oh, there we go, translation, aiming at the broader audience and explaining the field specific terms. Okay, cool. All right, so that's that's a little bit about how you make your content connect to broader audiences. The second thing I want to talk about is connecting your content to those audiences. So we we make content that connects and now we've got to connect that content, right? And that's kind of the trickier part. Um, I have three circles of, of PR that I like to think of. There's the inner circle PR. This is how we spread our shows um, through the guests that we have. I invite each guest to share. I ask them directly, do you have like a sub stack or do you have like an email list that you use? And would you be um, willing to share this with them? Uh, do you, how, how active on social media are you? Guests themselves are one of the most important promoters of, of your podcast. Um, uh, if you have co-hosts, they obviously are kind of on the hook to help uh, share things. Anyone that works on your show, if you have people doing editing or transcript or whatever, I directly invite them, hey, will you, will you share this on your page? Will you let people know about this? Um, I like to directly contact them. Uh, I have a, an email that I use kind of, I personalize it, but it's basically a form, a formula email that I can plug and play with. I recommend having that uh, when the episode comes out, I'll send that to, to everybody individually and invite them to do it. I also include in that email, all the links, some images, some descriptions they can use. I try to make it as easy as possible for them to share it. Oh, it's, all they got to do is copy and paste. Bada bing, bada boom. Like try to eliminate any kind of barrier for them. So that's your inner circle, the people that were directly connected. Um, outer circle is one step removed. So this is when you're doing stuff on social media. I'll, I'll tag the publishers in social media posts. I'll reach out directly to their publicist if I've worked through a publicist and ask them, hey, do you have... Uh, do you guys have a newsletter that you do? And would you be interested in featuring this? And, um, you know, I give a shout out to the press during the episode. This would be, this is great promotion, et cetera. So try to work directly with um, people that have a vested interest in promoting the scholar or the work that they produced um, and tag them on social media when you do it. Uh, look for people who are retweeting and interacting with your comment and be sure to be interactive with them when they're doing that. So that's your outer circle. And then deep space PR. This is where I actually will go to different academic organizations or online discussion groups, Facebook groups, uh, Reddit forums, um, and especially ones that have already been involved with a little bit. So it doesn't look like I'm spamming, um, but I'll go to uh, another, another, I did a series with Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. And I would go to, I, I contacted some of the people on their on the advisory board for the series. So not just the publicist, but actually some of the advisory board that were like overseeing the series and let them know about, hey, I'm doing this series of episodes about your books. Um, 
do you have ideas about how we can share that? So that's kind of like getting further out. Are there like community groups that are interested, book groups that you have, um, connecting outside the academy, right? Um, just trying to find any anywhere where conversations are happening that you think people would, would uh, benefit from. Okay, uh, another way to, to connect outside the academy is doing in-show spots. Uh, so for example, guest swaps, having someone come to talk to you on your show and seeing if you can talk to them on their show. Um, since I'm doing mostly interviews with scholars, it doesn't make sense as much to have hosts come on. So I'll do mini episodes where I'll have somebody come on and talk to him for 15 or 20 minutes and, and kind of talk about making shows. It's a little behind the scenes and I've, been surprised at how interested listeners are in kind of getting a behind the scenes glimpse. So sometimes you can connect with other shows, then their listeners will hear about your show. Um, ad swaps are kind of the same thing. Um, finding similar podcasts or shows that are in in the same kind of area and saying, hey, I got this 30 second spot that just explains how my show, uh, what my show is. I'd love to feature your show uh, in one of my episodes. Do you have an ad we can swap? I would love to do that, throw it on the beginning or ending of, of an episode. I actually set up in the format of my show, a third act break. So about, it's an hour long episode. So about the 45 minute mark, uh, I cut away and can throw ads and stuff in those spots, not paid ads. I don't do any paid ads, but basically just trying, this is a way to, to exchange promotion. Um, and it, that can be tricky. Um, some people are reluctant to do it anyway. And I'm also particular about who I do that with because I, I don't want to recommend stuff that I wouldn't listen to. <laughs> you have to be careful about, um, you don't want to send your listeners someplace that you think, you know, you're going to lose credibility. Oh, I'm not really going to take those recommendations seriously. Feed drops is, an, is the least common, but most like impactful way. This one, you actually put a straight up episode of a show in your feed and they put an episode of your show in their feed. Uh, the New York Times does this with their own shows. If you listen to The Daily with Michael Barbaro, See You Tomorrow, um, they will put uh, additional New York Times shows straight into The Daily feed. Um, if you can find someone to do that, you're, you've hit, you struck gold. That That's awesome. The other way is to fish for reviews from your listeners. I actively solicit reviews from my listeners and I do more than just saying, don't forget to rate and review because that just goes right over people's heads. Um, at the end of the show or during that third act break, I'll read a review of the month. That sent my reviews through the roof. I would get maybe one or two reviews an episode tops. When I started reading reviews, it doubled or tripled. Um, I have almost 300 reviews at this point. Uh, and I only, I've done uh, 15 episodes. Um, so uh, that's a great way to do it. Um, all right. What about paid advertising on social media? I found that it's hit or miss, honestly. Um, there's some issues with <laughs> the new privacy laws and how Apple, you can ask your phone not to track you and all that. So targeted ads have actually become a lot more complicated. Um, and sometimes I've found too that Facebook's not great at if you ch choose like, oh, Facebook's like, we know the audience that'll like this. Let us pick our smart audience. I found that that's not good. <laughs> if you're going to do paid ads, drill it down yourself. There are ways to do that. There are tutorials on how to do that. I don't recommend using Facebook's automated stuff. Um, it brought a lot of like trolls and stuff to my show. So, I mean, if you're out looking for trolls, then go ahead and do that. The other thing I like to do is gather materials for a media kit. So I always get images of the guest and their books. You can get that from them or from their publicists. And I use those uh, to make content for social media. This is a little advertisement spot that I use. If you haven't heard of the website Headliner, it's free. It's awesome. It will help make these little, I'll just give you a quick example. On the next episode of Fireside with Blair Hodges, anthropologist Ayala Fader joins us to discuss her book, Hidden Heretics, Jewish Doubt in the Digital Age. So it even will do subtitles and stuff and fancy stuff. I like to do quotes from the episodes, just stuff to drive online engagement. Um, but the truth of the matter is you're going to have to talk about the show pretty much all the time. Sometimes uh, people in the academy are skittish about self-promotion. And I think if we're in the podcasting space, we have to get really comfortable with self-promotion, not only for ourselves, but also the guests that we invite on the show. Um, yeah, and so that's that's pretty much all. So to, to sum it back up, I talked about how our content itself connects with broader audiences. We've got to make it relevant. We've got to make it connect personally. 
Um, minds are changed through emotional connection rather than data and fact giving. Um, so fact without emotion is, I don't know, it's pretty, pretty useless to me. Um, so we got to connect our content and then we got to connect that content to those broader audiences. That's all I got. Awesome. Thank you, Blair. Paul, are you ready to take over? I'm ready. I'm, all right. That's a hard act to follow though. Um, I don't have any slides. Um, so I, I was just planning to, um, tell you a little bit about my experience, um, uh, producing a podcast, being a, being an academic, um, and to kind of highlight a few areas of, uh, that I think, you know, are worth passing on, um, and when it comes to connecting with, uh, with a community or communities. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a linguist and I, uh, study, I would say, yeah, I, I study regional dialects of, of English. Um, I lived in New York City, did my PhD in New York City, so that was a brilliant place to uh, to get started in English dialects. Uh, and then I moved to Newfoundland, uh, which is another amazing place for regional variation, um, uh, Irish English, um, English English, um, uh, Scottish. We have uh, a lot of a lot of uh, um, the three four hundred years of migration from uh, from Europe to to uh, Newfoundland. Um, so uh, so I've, I've been I've been surrounded by um, variation in language, um, and so. But more recently, I've gotten into um, looking at um, and working with. Um, people who live with communication impairments or um, language uh, uh, speech and language challenges. And this might seem like a not quite a logical jump. Um, but the what was what I was interested in when I when I worked with uh, English dialects was um, the linguist what we call linguistic ideologies that stigmatize and discriminate um, against speakers who speak a non-standard variety of English. Um, these could be regional uh, dialects, um, they could be um, English accents um, from from uh, speaking a, another another uh, language um, as, a, as a first language. And so this um, this idea of, of stigma, um, was something that was always on my mind as I was working with, um, especially in, in Newfoundland and, and Labrador, um, uh, there's a significant amount of stigma on, uh, on speaking like a Newfoundlander. Um, there's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's seen, a, it's seen as, as interesting, but it's not something that will get you, um, a, a high paying job. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're, um, always speaking in a, in a traditional uh, Newfoundland English accent, um, it might, might be good for tourism, but uh, but it's not something that people uh, often take seriously if they hear somebody uh, speaking that way. Um, and and, and uh, as a linguist, I'm I'm primarily descriptive. I don't I don't have these uh, initial reactions that people do to stigmatize speech. Um, I I see them as valid systems of communication, um, but that's not. You know that's not how the the rest of the world uh, uh, often works, um, and so so working with this idea of stigma and discrimination, um, I I I got into working with um, people with communication disorders because that's essentially their main um, uh, resistance that they face um, when they're trying to communicate. Um, it's it first started with um a a talk that was given to our department um but from the newfoundland and labrador stuttering association um so this was a newly formed group in um in st john's newfoundland and the um the chair of the of the group and a, a couple other um people who were uh around at the the formation of the of the group and it was i should say it's only made been maybe three or four years so it's 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 fairly young um they, they wanted to um publicize what their group was about and so they did a a talk at the university um they had other public talks as well um thinking about communities this is interesting because it's the public who's trying to reach into the to the university um 
which I happen to happen to find quite quite compelling and interesting. Um, so after after their talk, I I gave them uh, I made a a proposal to them. I said, I'm a I'm a linguist. I study um, uh, differences, variation in how people communicate, how people sound when they communicate. Um, I you know is I'd be happy to work with you guys on a, on a project that we're mutually interested in, and so they they weren't expecting that at first. I don't think so. They, it took them a little bit uh, of you know, well, what can we work on together? And so I said, well, I'll explain the situation. I I'm interested in how people perceive um, variation in 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 the way people speak, um, and so they they kind of got behind that. And so from there, um, I I. It being associated with the university or having having status in a university, I was able to apply for some funding um, that I could use to hire a few students, and so we got started um, fairly quickly on a uh, a survey um, that was meant to um, uh, poll and ask que people questions about um, what is what are their responses to. Uh, uh, communication disorders. What? Uh, how do they evaluate or or communicate with uh, people who stutter? And so um, it was a small survey. We didn't we didn't have a, a you know a ton of money to to look into it. But we did come up with um, some interesting um, results. And and a lot of the um, results are similar to what uh, what we've been finding with when it comes to um, accented English or regional uh, varieties of English that um, if you sound um, not if you sound non-standard there there are some social consequences to that um, and so so that that was the that was the first thing that we started to do um, and so if you're if you are a um, a faculty member or somebody who, who's in, in, engaged or uh, connected to the university there's always these small pots of money um that are are sitting around and, and sometimes they're waiting for people to be to be used and I, mean, I say small um small from uh scholarly uh points of view is a thousand dollars two thousand dollars these uh you know they're they may be significant um you know amount of money to to students and and so if you can pay them five hundred uh dollars to work on a, a project or or a thousand dollars to help work on a podcast um they'll be they'll be quite interested and excited to do that um and and our university benefits from having an office of public engagement um so this is where the the that money had come from but they're in the business of making connections between um faculty members and community organizations um I, I already had a community organization through the Newfoundland and Labrador Stuttering Association, so um, it was a natural fit for me to go to the Office of Public Engagement and um, see if we could find some some additional funding to um, to put together a research project that ultimately benefits the community. Um, and this is kind of the the point. Another point that I wanted to make is that um, working with a community. Um, or, or members of the, of a, of a, of the community is it, it's a two way street. We can do things that will benefit, um, or they, we, we do, we're doing things that are benefiting my own research, but I'm doing something that they are benefiting from as well. And so if we building this, uh, relationship with community members outside of the university is it's very important that, um, that it's collaborative. That it's something that um, everybody will benefit from in the end. Um, so I think that's um, that's something that um, is is built into the relationship from the very beginning. Um, it wasn't I didn't approach them thinking like this would be a great um, you know topic for research without thinking what what can I give back to them um, as being part of a, a of this research. So um, from there is. We, we started working on uh, another project which looked at um, um, which was meant to survey uh, people with communication um, uh, challenges uh, who regularly see speech language pathologists or people who who are considering see seeing a speech language pathologist for therapeutic work um, 
And it was a province-wide survey sent to um, schools, teachers, uh, parents of, uh, of, of kids who stutter, um, people who stutter themselves. And we just worked with our own networks to, to send out these surveys. Um, but, the, but the idea behind it was what is missing from uh, our province when it comes to access to services for people who stutter? Um, what do uh, people who stutter need from, um, from, from the province? Um, where, where should, where could the uh, provincial government be spending more money uh, on, on providing um, services for, um, for people who stutter? So um, that was, that was a, uh, it still is an ongoing project that we're working on. But from that is where we started, um, we started to produce a, uh, a, a, we started with actually a, a short documentary video. And then from the short documentary video, where people talked about their lived experiences as people who stutter, um, we started the, the podcast um, called Some Stutter La. Um, and so uh, it's, we're going into our, we're just finishing our third season. We have 65 episodes uh, under our belt, which I didn't see coming when we first started this. Um, the, the host, and I'll, I'll actually show you, um, I want to play a little bit of the, the podcast here just to give you a sense of how it looks and how it sounds. Um, so I think I can do that right here, share sound and optimize for video. Okay. So here's, um, a fairly recent episode, um, and so I'll, I'll just let it play for uh, a couple, um, about a minute or so. So the music is uh, written by one of our uh, team members, a, a, an undergraduate student who's a very talented pianist. Um, so we, we're definitely pooling our resources here when we when we asked if he if he had any music that he could contribute to the show um, I'm just going to go fast or fast forward just a little bit because in as uh, as Blair had mentioned this is where the hook normally is um, but because this this video wasn't um, hasn't been fully processed yet we don't have the the hook in there but by the time it it's posted on YouTube and through our anchor um, our uh, anchor website um it'll have uh, a quote from the guest who speaking on something that is relevant to for for the show um so i'm just going to fast forward here until we get to here welcome to some stutter law newfoundland labrador's first podcast about living with communication disorders it is a production of the communication collaborative my name is Greg O'Grady. I am a person who stutters and your host. Some Stutter Law aims to rebuild confidence and hope for people who live with communication differences by dismantling myths, stigma, stereotypes, and barriers. For more information about the Communication Collaborative or this podcast, you can find us at somestutterlaw.ca. If you only get one thing from this podcast, we hope it's this. It's okay to stutter and it's okay to communicate differently. It's not how we communicate that's important, it's the message that's important. Today, Some Stutter Law warmly welcomes Brian Wu. Okay, so that's the, um, that's, you know, the, basically how, how every episode starts. We have this quote and then the uh, host of the episode introduces himself. And uh, Greg, who's the host, um, is a person who stutters, but he, uh, the, the, you know, not, not everyone who stutters stutters all the time. Um, it's a variable uh, um, uh, thing, and um, he's he's gotten quite good at the uh, introduction to the show, where he has it written down on a script that he 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 doesn't stutter at the beginning of the of the show but throughout the throughout the episode and as he interviews each of his guests you you can you can hear more of his stuttering um we've taken the deliberate decision not to edit out any stuttering i mean that's basically what the show is about 
um, all the guests uh, who stutter or have uh, another um, speech or language um, uh, challenge. Um, that's there. That we keep that we keep all of that in. Um, when we transcribe the episodes, the stutters are transcribed as well. Um, and as we as we were working on the episode or uh, uh, the the podcast, um, we were we started to become aware that stuttering podcasts are are not unheard of. There's 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 a few of them that already exist. Um, so we're, we're joining this community of other podcasters who are um, producing podcasts that are meant to shed light on communication disorders uh, and the lived experience of what it means and what it's like to live with a, commu a communication um, disorder. So, um, so there's, there's communities at different levels that we're engaging with. First, we're engaging with um, people who stutter and another communication uh, impairments. Um, we're communicating and trying to engage with uh, Newfound Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. The, the podcast brands itself as Newfoundland and Labrador's first podcast about communication challenges. Um, so we have, we have the, the general public that we're trying to get to as well. Um, a third community that we're working with are speech language pathologists. Um, they also, a number of them also have their own podcasts. So we're entering into this system of uh, multiple communities that um, are at the point where they're, 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 still, they're still learning from each other. We're learning from all the other podcasts, all the other SLPs, speech language pathologists that are out there, um, and, the, and, and our guests. So every episode, regardless of if it's our podcast or someone else's podcast, we're contributing something new to the uh, dialogue about communication disorders. And it's an exciting uh, thing to be part of. Um, if, if it wasn't for Greg, the host, who said, let's produce a podcast every single week, um, we wouldn't be at 65 <laughs> episodes right now. And we're planning to go into season four. We're, we're, gonna, we're taking a break in, in two more weeks for a couple of months and then uh, recharge our batteries and then start season four in the, uh, in the new year. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's been quite an amazing uh, adventure so far. And um, we, we're, we're, we're just excited to be able to, to continue this uh, as, a, as, as a volunteer basis. Basically, Every, when, when I don't have money coming from uh, academic um, funding uh, units or agencies, um, everybody works on a volunteer basis. Um, all the guests are, are appear on as uh, uh, the episodes as volunteers. Our production team, which is currently uh, myself and three undergraduate students, um, that's that's all uh, volunteer work on their part. And uh, Greg, the host, um, is uh, is is completely um, volunteer as well. And he he he's retired from his his career uh, five years ago, but. Um, part of running this podcast means he he's no longer in retirement. He's he's almost working a full time job again, um, finding ho finding finding people to uh, interview, and um, and producing the uh, the uh, each episode on a weekly basis. Which I think I thought at first was uh, and still do. I think it's a difficult thing to do, but he was pretty adamant that this is this is how we do it. So uh, let's let's give it a shot. And as long as there is interest and and motivation on his side um and and we could still find guests to interview for each each week then i said okay i'll i'll be along for the ride and do as much as i can to uh to put this show together as well um so that's just a a, a quick introduction to um what we do um and how we uh, are designed to work and collaborate with um community members outside of the university. And so I'm happy to chat more with uh, anybody who has questions about this um, after in our Q&A. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I want to make sure that we have time for the Q&A and there are only about 15 minutes left in this session. Great, great. Um, so um, what I'm going to do uh, right now is I'm, uh, I'm going to 
I think, I, so I'll show you guys two things very quickly that I was planning to talk about, and I'm going to ask you some questions, um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, so um, this is the website for my podcast. It's called High Theory. I co-host it with a colleague of mine, Sharonik Bosu, um, and um, we do short 15-minute episodes, each of which takes a keyword concept from um, from academic discourse um, and uh, doesn't really attempt to define it so much as ask curious questions about it. Um, and I guess the, um, the thing that puzzles me a little bit about this is that we were like, our adamant goal was to reach beyond the academy. When we started this, we were like, this is going to be like um, drunk history, but it's going to be like high theory. It's going to be like getting, um, you know, like breaking down the um, seriousness around literary theory. Um, and instead, we mostly got excited academics, right? Um, but I run this other project, um, which is not a podcast. It's not audio based. It's called Politics of the Prescription Pad. Um, and it's an interdisciplinary working group about pain pharmacology. Um, and um, this project, which is brand new, has actually been a lot more successful in getting engagement from, um, from people who are not humanists. So oftentimes medical humanities projects like this one um, will just get a bunch of humanists showing up and um, no allied health professionals. Um, but um, we have had more doctors and nurses show up to this than um, historians and literary scholars. Um, so um, I guess like the, the things that I have found in comparing these two projects is like, think, like who you work with often determines who your audience is, right? Um, so I started the politics of the prescription pad project with a physician um, and that meant that he had a bunch of connections that he was able to draw and to pull people in. So I think that's um, connected to what Paul was saying with like, if you start with a community group, you have a built in audience already. Um, and also, I think. Um, yeah. Um, uh, defining a specific public that you're trying to reach is really important, right? There is no such thing as a general public. Um, there are only, I mean, the, the public is as fractured as the academy. Right? Um, and so the questions I want to ask you guys maybe to open things up are, who do we mean when we say outside the academy? So not just like, how can we do this? But like, who are we talking to? Who are these audiences? And what's the point? Like, what are the goals of public scholarship? Why do you think it's important to do this? So um, I'd love to hear thoughts from the audience. Um, if you're willing to turn on your cameras, we'd love to see your faces too. I mean, maybe raise your hand if you wanna say something and I'll call on you. Avon, yeah. Hi. Um I very, you know, it's interesting to think about all of these things. Um, when I think about connecting with communities, the other, it, it's sort of, I guess what, what you've all been sort of talking back and forth about is, are we talking about getting other people to listen to our podcast, which is absolutely a form of connecting with communities, like not in any way suggesting it's not, but are we also, but also um, are we looking, for instance, of ways of finding guests to be on our podcast or people to work with who are in a community? Who Are we looking to find ways to be, like Paul was talking about, be helpful to a community that already exists by, um, you know, but you can't be helpful to a community if you're not connected to that community. And, and, and so if you're not already a member of a, and when I say a community rather than the community, but like a specific subset of the general public, um, and I wonder if anyone has any experiences or specific thoughts about that, um, because I think trying to just get your podcast out to lots of people, which is 100% an important thing, and a, there's no point in doing it if you're not getting it to people, um, 
but is only one part of what I sort of have thought about of that topic. So I don't know if anyone in the in the larger group or anyone has any um, thoughts about how to make those connections. Hi, I'm a podcaster and I'm interested in your group. <laughs> like, <laughs> how awkward is that conversation? <laughs> yeah, Rachel, do you have a response? I, I had a question and a response to what you said before. Um, first of all, um, how do all of you know who's listening? Like what, ha like, for example, the first speaker said, well, I know that the people listening to my show are largely Mormon. How do you know that? How do you know the demographics of who's listening? Um, and I guess uh, my rather grandiose answer to the question of like, what's the point um, what's the point of of either reaching outside the academy or get, just getting more people to listen to my podcast? I think that those are the same. It's the same answer for me, which is that um, I'm really interested in dismantling uh, these institutional gatekeeping kind of spaces for, in my case, poetry. Uh, and sort of conversations around uh, literary arts and, and really actively taking power away from the universities um, so that the podcast, it's, the existence of the podcast itself was always intended as kind of an anti-university tool. Um, but whether or not I'm doing that, um, I, I kind of have no way of really measuring um, or figuring out. Yeah, Blair, do you have an answer about metrics? Yeah, so the way I did it was I just ran an audience uh, survey. I ran a survey monkey thing. And so it's not precise or scientific, but um, I also am judging based on where I see my stuff being retweeted or shared. So it's engagement and then also feedback surveys. And I just made the survey and on, on, on a couple episodes said, hey, I got the survey. It'd be really helpful. And you know, if you include your email address, I'm not going to send you anything. It's not a spam thing, but you could win. I'll send you one of the books uh, that of an author. That we, so I provide an incentive too. Cool. Do do other people have thoughts about um, audience polling and metrics before? I I'd love to hear Dario if you have a thought on that or if you want to ask your question. Uh, well, kind of. I mean, it, it it does link to what Rachel has just said and what you said about what's the point. And, um, you know, to me, often it relates back to the idea of what we might consider academic podcasting as different from any any kind of podcasting, right? And I don't know how it, how it is. I mean, I know that both of the speakers there, Paul, particularly talked a little bit about support and um, having undergrad undergrads helping and stuff like that just from some background I've been podcasting since 2015 I'm a film study scholar by you know by history let's say or by profession um but then I do a, a, a podcast called the podcast studies podcast so I'm kind of part of a community now that and I mean I think sort of the humanities podcast is sort of adjacent to that um but that that whole idea of what's the point is something that I'm always reflecting on because often the point is nothing to do with the university because the university isn't interested in in whether or not I'm reaching audience at, out, audiences outside academia. Indeed, it's not interested whether I'm podcasting or not, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so therefore, the motivation for me comes from the fact that I want to talk about films and I want to talk about interesting people within films uh, or within film academia, let's say as well, not just filmmaking, but there are there is a crossover with my podcast. And I've increasingly felt that the university is not a space in which a free, free form flow of ideas and communication can take place. Either it's prescribed the way that you do it. I'm not, I'm a really, <laughs> people who know me know this, I'm a big hater of academic conferences and the prescriptive way in which, you know, conversation and communication takes place. And I just found that the, the podcast was a way of set of, of setting up dialogue and production of knowledge in ways that I felt were much more interesting and productive. And the fact that there is an audience that's come on the back of that is great. And all of the feedback I get is simply, you know, when I go out uh, and, you know, UK is a lot, lot smaller than US, obviously and see people in different contexts. A lot of them have heard of my podcast and are willing to talk on it. So 
it's kind of a, a, a sort of self-motivational thing that's become a bigger thing as part of my cultural life. Sorry, that uh, sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but there we go. No, it was great. And Paul, do you have a response? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I do. Um, I just wanted to say quickly um, that we are kind of a, we're still a niche group of, uh, of academics. Um, I would say the vast majority of my colleagues wouldn't be in this position. They're not interested in, they may, maybe that might be put it too bluntly. They're not interested or they're not, they don't see it as part of their, their job to communicate beyond publishing in journals, um, at presenting at academic conferences. Um, you know, th this is seen as a, a soft thing to do. Um, uh, helping people is a soft thing to do still uh, in in many in many academic environments. Um, so the fact that you know we are all here, we're kind of we're kind of in tune with that idea of of reaching out, engaging um, in a way that already sets us apart from a lot of our, our our colleagues at our at our own institutions. So what's the point when you say what ask what the point is? we all we kind of already have our own reasons for doing it we don't need to be convinced that there should be a point to it i mean there is but we've defined those are those points ourselves right just one more thing i think it really speaks to the goal that you have for what your podcast is trying to do um doing this i left the academy in 2020 and i wanted to stay connected to it and so that's why that's one of the main reasons I started this show. But it, but even when I was doing a podcast at a university, the goal was to connect with people that weren't there. And that the other impetus behind it was just we needed better intersectionality at the university I was at. And this was a way to include uh, people of color, queer voices, um, indigenous voices uh, and I wanted my show to also connect um, intersectionally with race and gender and sexuality, but also with academic research in general. I have historians listening that hear this anthropologist talking and they're like, oh, I've never really studied anthropology. Holy cow, this is some, I can use this. Like, this is really fascinating. So I think the poetry one was interesting about like, <laughs> this is kind of a way to, this maybe take some power back from universities. My I, my show probably couldn't exist without the current university structure for all of its problems. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Ayani, do you want to chime in? So I know we're at the end of the session. We're really close. So thank you very much for all of your insights. Um, but I had a quick question about defining your audience. Um, so I run what I call a, a semi-academic podcast with a friend in which we talk a lot about literature, uh, which we describe expansively, but in a way we're kind of like, well, anyone who wants to talk about literature is welcome to listen, but that in a way does not feel like we're actually defining an audience. Um, so I just, in our last couple of minutes, do you have any suggestions about how to do that um, when you are trying to reach out to kind of audiences beyond the academy? There's a really great exercise in um, the NPR uh, podcast startup guide. I don't know if you've seen this, but it basically has you imagine your audience in really specific ways. Um, and it has some questions and exercises in here about just getting really specific. And it defines like your, your audience, your core audience, your proximate audiences, your tertiary audiences, and gives some advice about how you, the structure of your show and the way you talk can bridge those, like your super nerds and, and your people that are just kind of interested in it. And for example, just one example is like, when you hear a scholar define in very plain terms, something that everyone in the field already knows, most of the time they'll say something really cool about it because they're trying to put it in new language. And so not only are you translating it for, um, for, audiences that aren't in right within the conversations but but those geeky nerds 
it also gives them either something really like, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of that, or something to even argue with or be like, why did they, ooh, why'd they do it that way? I, I think this is better. So do that audience, the audience exercise, which has you imagine, even down to like visualizing a person and kind of like having a picture of a person there that when you're making your show, you're thinking about, I'm thinking, it's funny, based on my initial audience feedback, I've, my show is like really popular amongst women from 40 to 55. And I, what I realized is a lot of these women from a Mormon background didn't go to, didn't get a finished university degrees, but they're really, they really wish they could. And this is a way for them to like plug into academic conversations that they never really got to be involved in, in an accessible way. So now when I'm thinking of my episodes, like I have that audience in mind and I'm interacting with that demographic on, on social media more. So sometimes your audience will begin to define itself too. This it's, this is a co-created thing. So, um, but I recommend those audience exercises. They're really helpful. Awesome. And so with that, I, I'm going to tell everyone, thank you because we have hit our time. Um, and uh, if you want to continue this conversation in the gather town, um, for some reason, the chat seems to be disabled, so I can't send you the link. But if you have it from before, that would be awesome. Um, and I uh, look forward to seeing you at the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, everyone.